Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're we'll going through those words uh, connected with the Apostles' Creed and Genesis chapter 1. Let us pray. Lord God, uh, we pray that, that you would speak to our hearts through your word. In, in all the changes that are going on um, in society, in our world, with the weather, even in our church, we pray that you would give us a solid foundation on the basic truths of Scripture and a relationship with you. And I pray that you would speak to us through your word and don't let me, your servant, get in the way of what you are doing. Amen. So, I don't know, maybe six months ago, uh, when I was starting to plan out this sermon series, uh, I started doing some research as to ancient practices in the Christian church. And, and I couldn't find exactly when this started, but very early on, maybe second, third century, early Christians would look at the season of Easter and they count back 40 days. Uh, 40 is a significant time period uh, in, in Scripture. It, the the Lord sent rains on the earth in the days of Noah and the flood for 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, Moses went up on the mountain for 40 days to meet with God at Mount Sinai. Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness and probably most significantly, Jesus, after his baptism, spent 40 days uh, in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And so this has been kind of a time period um, that's been known where, where God is up to something big, where God is working with human beings doing something monumental. And so the early Christians took that idea and connected it to Easter, and they called the season the time of Lent. And very, very early on, uh, many people during the time of Lent, this 40-day period, uh, maybe you know is the time when people maybe give up meat or give up something or, or do some fasting, but especially for the early Christians, they would go through a time of deeper study of the truths of Scripture in preparation for new baptisms on Easter. That there would be people who were coming in the Christian church, they would get this instruction and preparation for baptisms. Because on Easter, um, we celebrate how Jesus died and went into the tomb and was raised to life. Just like in our baptisms, we're buried with Christ in our baptism and we're raised to life. And so I thought maybe we could go through some of the basic teachings of Scripture. And I know some of you have just gone through this class with me, so uh, I try to keep it uh, as different as I could, but this might be reviewed for some of you. But I wanted to go back to the basic truths, especially in the Apostles' Creed. And so uh, we want to go through the first paragraph of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. But before you can say, I believe in a God, maybe we should step back and ask this question. How do I know God exists? How do I know God even exists? I mean, is it just delusional for us to come here a week after a week, uh, get up early on daylight savings time, uh, you know, and, and battle through the, 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 the crazy weather to get here? Are we just delusional? Some people uh, smarter than me have said we are. Uh, probably one of the more famous books that's out there, maybe you've heard me mention it before, by a, a famous kind of militant atheist, Richard Dawkins. Uh, his title of his book is um, The God Delusion. Very pointedly saying, if you still believe in this invisible God, you're delusional. So is he right? Um, how do we know that there's God, that there is a God? Well, the Apostle Paul, who we've been talking about the last few weeks, he wrote a letter he wrote a letter to a church in Rome. He didn't meet the church yet, and so he knew that there were some Christians that were gathering, and Paul writes this letter to Rome called the Letter to the Romans, and it's kind of this treatise, this, this doctrinal study of the basic truths of Scripture. And this is kind of his basic Christianity class, and in the first chapter of his letter to the Romans, Paul says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Our light bulb's a little bit not bright on our projector. I might do that so you can see it better. So, um, Paul is saying, you're right. God's invisible. 
There is an invisible God and his qualities are invisible, his eternal power and his divine nature. Those are also invisible. So how do we know that there really is a God? Are we just delusional? Well, Paul says, those, the invisible God has been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that nobody has an excuse. I've used this illustration before. If you've been around me for any amount of time, you've probably heard me say this, but, but bear with me one more time. Um, if we want to know about Steve Jobs, none of us can go see him today, right? No one, he's invisible to us today, practically, right? But if I want to know Steve Jobs, I can look at the things that he has made. I have something that I have access to. Um, probably many of you have one in your pocket, uh, an Apple iPhone, Right? And, and if I look at an Apple iPhone, I can know something about the inventor. If I, I can do science, I'll do science on the iPhone and I learn that whoever made this was wise, um, intelligent, loved music, loved simplicity, loved design, loved all the functions, uh, knew how to put information in this, and I learned something incredible about its creator as I do science on the phone. And the same thing, science is observing, the, looking at the world and studying it. The more we study what God has made, the more we get to know the God behind it. You look at creation, you get to know the creator. You look at invention, you know the inventor. And what happens when we start doing science on our bodies and in our world? We realize that, that whoever made this was incredibly wise, loved information, loved beauty, that, that just as nobody would say, wow, that, that iPhone is too complex, too designed, too well made to have just popped into existence, when you start down and to think about it, you start looking at our bodies and our world, it's way too designed, way too complex, way too intentional to just have popped into existence. In fact, that's why nobody has an excuse. Everybody knows there's a God. In fact, the Bible says it pretty pointedly. It says, um, the fool says in his heart there is no God. You have to suppress this idea. All of us know there's a God. But that leads to another question. Which God is the right God? I mean, isn't there millions of religions out there? Which God is the God we should follow? Which religion should we choose? We know there's something greater than us. Where should we invest our time and energy? Where should we put our focus? Well, there's a writer in the Old Testament, somebody who lived about 700 years before Jesus, a prophet named Isaiah. And God was speaking through him, and, and, and Isaiah said this, All the nations gather together, and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say it is true. I love this. He's saying, let everybody gather together, all the peoples and all the different gods. Let, let's have a, a God conference and let's bring all the gods to this conference. Let's bring all of them together and, and let's ask the question of all the different gods, which God foretold and proclaimed the former things. Uh, let's lay out all of, he says, let them bring their witnesses, okay? Let's have a God conference, and let's bring all the different holy books of all the different religions, all the witnesses, all the priests, all the pastors, all the religious leaders. Let's lay them all out on the table and ask this one question. Which one told us the things that were going to happen? Which, which religion, which holy book has stood the test of time? And you know what? When you lay them all out, only the Bible still stands. There's a reason that we don't believe in Greek gods anymore. Because they couldn't stand to this test. And there's reason that many people are walking away from all sorts of religion in the past, from the past, because they don't stand the test of time. And yet at the same time, the Bible is the most heavily scrutinized book in the world, and it still stands. Um, the, the Bible has over 300 prophecies that point to Jesus and 100% of them have come true. Not only that, if you really want to read something that blows your mind, read the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, Daniel, who lived about five, 600 years before Jesus, prophesies all the future nations that are going to come into power. He's seen the Assyrians, he's seen the Babylonians, 
but he prophesies about the Persians. And then he predicts the Greeks. Then he predicts the Roman Empire. And then he says, during the time of the Roman Empire, the Messiah will come. The Lord, the Messiah, Jesus will come. And so, which God is the right God? Lay them all out and you'll find that the Bible has stood this test of time, that you can trust the Bible, that you can read the Bible with complete assurance that this is true. Now, hopefully that gives you, at least perks all of our interest as we talk about the basics of our faith to maybe look into the Bible. And when we go into the basics of our faith, the first paragraph of the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, um, we, we open up the Bible and see the origin story. And we want to answer this question. How did we get here? How do we get here and what is our purpose? That's really what so many, I mean, all worldviews, all religions are trying to answer this basic question, how do we get here and where are we going? How do we get here and where are we going? Now, lots of world religions have an answer to this, or supposedly. Um, the ancient Babylonian religion that was written about the same time Moses was writing down Genesis, so the, at the same time this Bible was first being written, the Babylonians were writing their their manuscripts and their religion. And the Babylonians looked out at the world and they saw the violence that was going on. They saw the evil in the world. And so they talked about a god named Marduk. And they, they said, the, the way we got here, because there's so much violence and evil in the world, we got here because of an act of violence. And, and this is a, uh, an ancient kind of text from the Babylonian god. And, and so they, they believed that this Marduk was in this this cosmic battle with a, a fish monster called Temet. And, and he sliced Temet in half, and half of Temet went into the sky, and the coagulated blood in the sky, that's the stars. And then the coagulated blood down below, that's what humans were. Because he looked, the, the Babylonians looked at the world and saw the evil and violence and said, we must have come up because of violence and wickedness. That's how we got here, an act of violence. And so evil and violence, according to the ancient Babylonians, it's just natural. It's just part of the way the world works. Now, more recent stories of how we got here aren't much different. Back in the 1940s, Edwin Hubble designed the Hubble telescope, and the people saw that the earth was expanding or the universe was expanding. And so they thought that if we could just turn back the clock, maybe we could find how it all started. And some people came up with this idea of a big bang which isn't much different than that story of Marduk slicing um, the, the sea monster, right? It, it started with violence. It started with a, an explosion. It started with chaos. And so again, uh, you look at our world and, and you think, well, there's so much chaos and craziness and evil going on in the world. This is just the Big Bang playing itself out. Darwin didn't sound, sound much different when Darwin said the reason human beings exist is because survival of the fittest. Dog eat dog world. You, you eat your way to the top. You crush the weak. You get rid of the weak and you strive to get to the top. And so violence and evil and crushing the weaker, that's just natural according to all these other stories of origin stories. But if you're a Christian, and you want to believe the very basics of Christianity, it starts with a totally different idea. The first page of the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, that the world and human beings were not started because of an act of violence or an act of chaos or by an accident, but God, the triune God, in his love said, let there be light, and there was light. And, and God, in his love, said, let there be water above and water below, the, the, the clouds and the water below. And then, then God says, oh, I love this. Uh, let there be dry land and vegetation. Those are the first three days. And then it says that, that God, in his love, filled the heavens, the light and the darkness, with the sun, moon, and stars. And then the next day, he filled the sky with birds, and he filled the, the water with fish. And then he filled the dry land with with animals. And like, like somebody, um, you know, if you ever have people over, you, you kind of get your house all ready and you set the table. It's like God was spending all this time setting the table, organizing things just as they were supposed to be. And he pulled up a chair and he invite, invited human, humanity to come sit down at the table. Because the last thing that he created was human beings. He said, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, 
so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created us in his image. Human beings are not evolved animals. Human beings are made in God's image to reflect God. And we're given a purpose to rule over this world. Not like an evil dictator, but like a caretaker. Like a manager of a house. Taking care of God's house and taking care of each other. Taking care of of human beings and taking care of this world that he has made. And he goes on to say, all right, so God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This could be one of the most significant verses in the history of the world. Because this verse is the foundation of human rights. Outside of this verse, there is no, um, there's no basis for human rights. Now, many people believe in human rights of lots of different backgrounds. You can be an atheist or, or, uh, or all these different other kind of belief system and believe in human rights. But your worldview will not give you a basis for human rights. If we started from an explosion, if we're evolved animals, this is the verse that gives the basis for human rights. That men and women are equal, and that we were created different than animals, we're created to reflect God, the goodness of God, the love of God, the creativity of God, the holiness of God. And this is why, whenever Christianity has made itself to a new continent, to a new people, women's rights go up. Equality of human beings go up. Slavery eventually goes away in every place where Christianity has reached. That's why Christianity is such a, um, a, 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 an author of good because of this idea that humans, no matter what their age, born or unborn, no matter how old they are, no matter what their mental uh, capacities are, they're made in the image of God and they deserve to be protected. They deserve to be loved. They deserve to be respected because they were made by God. Not as an accident, not, as, not because of an explosion, not an act of violence, but because God loved human beings and he made them. And now he gave them something to do. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase the number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. You know, there is a kingdom that humans are supposed to rule over as ambassadors for God. And then God looked at everything that he had made. and, And there's no evil There's no darkness, there's no death, there's no wickedness because he says, and God saw all that he had made and it was very good. No wickedness, no evil, no hatred, no gossip, no problems. It's very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. So that's the first page of the Bible. If you turn to the last page of the Bible, you'll see that it ends in a very great world. A great world where God and humans are joined together again in a holy city, in a new creation, and it renewed heavens and earth. So when I used to teach this class, some of you took this when I first got here as your pastor, I called this course not basic Christianity, but good to great. A world going from good to great. That's the storyline of history. That's the storyline of the Bible. But now we're caught in the middle of that story, aren't we? where evil and wickedness and disease and heartache and and sadness and fear seem to be all over the place. Where did that come from? And what is God doing about that? That's going to be the focus of next week. That's what we're going to be talking about next week, God's great rescue plan. But for right now, let's summarize what we learned. This is what Martin Luther said in his catechism. I believe that God created me and all that exists. And he gave me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my mind and all my abilities. This is our source of proper self-esteem. That you're not an accident. That God created you uh, for a purpose. That he's given 100% of you talents and abilities. He's given stuff for you to do and you are not an accident. God has created you for a purpose and you're going somewhere with your life. So that gives us a reason to get up every day. Um, Because of the basics of our faith, God is calling us to worship him, worship our creator by ruling over creation, taking care of each other, taking care of each other, taking care of the world around us. 
that, that every day we have a reason to live because we live a life of reflecting the image of God, worshiping the God who made us by taking care of each other, by taking care of this good world around us. That is the very basic, uh, basics of your faith. Basic point number one, you're not an accident. You were created by God for God, to live for God, to worship God. You can't love God too much because he's the one who made you. Amen. Please stand.